Hi everybody, so we're going to talk here about non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. And non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, I would recommend you watch the video on Hodgkin's lymphoma first because we're going to talk about, in a broad category, all the other lymphomas here. So it's kind of good to have something to compare it to. So lymphoma is a malignant proliferation of lymphocytes that collect in the lymphatic system. It's different from leukemia, whereas leukemia, as far as CLL and ALL, those are a uh, proliferation of lymphocytes in the bone marrow or in the peripheral circulation. So Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, which we talked about in the other side, is a specific form of lymphoma characterized on biopsy by the presence of Reed-Sternberg cells. You don't need to know what those look like, but you do need to know that they're associated uh, pathognomonically with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is every other lymphoma that doesn't fit into Hodgkin's. So basically every other uh, lymphoma that doesn't have Reed-Sternberg cells. So the stereotypical symptoms include painless lymphadenopathy and the constitutional symptoms like fever, unintended weight loss of 10% or more, and night sweats, which together we call these B symptoms. And then there are other symptoms that tend to show up with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or may show up with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because non-Hodgkin's lymphoma tends to present later in, uh, in stage. And this has to do both with why uh, there's a slightly worse prognosis and why we have some of these other symptoms. So symptoms to note would be an abdominal or testicular mass, nerve palsies, particularly of the facial nerve, so you'd have facial drooping, uh, and uh, of the oculomotor nerve, so you would have a uh, droopy eyelid. So those can be present, but there are lots of different other symptoms that can be present with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma simply because they present a little later on. The best initial step, just like Hodgkin's lymphoma, is going to be excisional lymph node biopsy. As far as diagnosing this, that is the best first thing to do. It's not going to be the only thing you do, but it's, that's the best first step to make the best step to make your diagnosis. You have to do it to make a diagnosis of any lymphoma. And it's excisional lymph node biopsy, not a needle biopsy. Very important to remember that. So some types of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, and this is in adults. Uh, this, is, this came from Medscape. So diffuse large B cell and follicular cell uh, lymphomas make up the, the majority. There's MALT, which comes a lot of times comes from, uh, is in the stomach. Uh, can be a complication of, uh, of chronic infection with H. pylori, and then some of the less common ones. So the symptoms, as mentioned, painless lymphadenopathy, often but not always B symptoms. Keep in mind that there are other causes of nodal filtration, so keep that differential diagnosis open. Uh, so other solid carcinomas, lung and so forth. And non-Hodgkin's lymphoma tends to present at a more advanced point, as mentioned. So they tend to present uh, with uh, additional symptoms in addition to your painless lymphadenopathy and your uh, B symptoms. So some of these things can be the nerve palsies, dysphagia, bone pain, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, abdominal, uh, abdominal mass, or testicular mass. So a full physical is going to be really important on these patients. And as mentioned, for diagnosis, an excisional nodal biopsy is absolutely necessary. And this will give you your histological diagnosis, which will help you differentiate uh, from this long, long list of dozens of different non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. So though there are many forms of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, they are treated similarly. And upon making the diagnosis of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's going to be really important to get a couple things done. First, you're going to want to assess the extent. And you're going to do this by getting a neck, chest, abdominal, and pelvic imaging. You want to, you want to get the whole, uh, for basically from the chin all the way down to the lower pelvis. And that's going to help you determine the extent of the diagnosis by looking for these lymph nodes. And you're also going to want to get a bone marrow biopsy. And the reason that we don't necessarily need a, Hod uh, in Hodgkin's lymphoma, we don't necessarily need a bone marrow biopsy. 
Um, but we do need it in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And as mentioned, the reason is because this presents at a later stage. So we want to have a bone marrow biopsy to see if there are lymphoma, lymphoma cells in the bone marrow. That's going to be important as far as making our prognosis and treatment and so forth. So other things that should be done in uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, if the patient has bone pain or if they have on their labs an elevated elk foss, they should be getting a bone scan. And if they have neurological symptoms or any kind of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that's advanced, then they should also get a lumbar puncture to check for lymphoma cells in the cerebral spinal fluid. And so with all this information, then we can go ahead and stage the disease. And it's actually the same way we stage Hodgkin's lymphoma. We stage lymphoma the exact same way for all lymphomas, regardless of what kind they are. So if you have lymphoma in just one nodal site, it's stage one. If you have lymphoma in two separate sites, uh, but they are on the same side of the diaphragm, it doesn't matter if they're left or right, as long as they're on the same side of the diaphragm, so either below the diaphragm or above the diaphragm, then you've got stage two. So one site is stage one, two sites, as long as they're on the same side of the diaphragm, stage two. If you have lymphoma on uh, both sides of the diaphragm, then you've got stage three. Regardless of whether you have two sites or three sites or five sites, regardless of whether they're all on the left or all on the right, if, if you've got lymphoma on both sides of the diaphragm, it's stage three. And if you have lymphoma in the extranodal sites, so uh, in the CNS, in the spleen, in the uh, bone marrow, then you've got stage four uh, lymphoma. And obviously the uh, survival rate is going to be inversely proportional to the stage. And what, what does that B mean? If you have B symptoms, you just tack on B to the end of the stage. So 1B, 2B, 3B, 4B. Moving on to treatment for non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, we always treat non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patients with chemotherapy. Now this stands in contrast to Hodgkin's lymphoma where in a minority of patients, we can treat them with radiation therapy, although in most Hodgkin's lymphoma patients, they too will need to be treated with chemotherapy. The standard treatment for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is CHOP. And you'll see this come up in some other cancers as well. We use CHOP. Uh, so CHOP, it's just C-H-O-P. It's really a mnemonic to remember the drugs. More recently, we've added on the drug rituximab. So it's also called R-CHOP if you're using rituximab. Rituximab is a monoclonal antibody that targets the cell surface antigen CD20. And this is an antigen that is uh, common on B cells, and uh, so that's why we use it for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, because we're destroying cells directly with rituximab, the, a very common side effect of rituximab is tumor lysis syndrome, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The C stands for cyclophosphamide. The adverse effects here are hemorrhagic cystitis and cancer. So just remember cyclophosphamide starts with a C you can get cystitis and cancer. Donumycin or hydroxydonumycin really doesn't have that many effects other than myelosuppression, which is pretty common for all the antineoplastic drugs. Vincristine or Oncovin, which is an O, uh, stands, uh, so this can cause peripheral neuropathy. All the vinca alkaloids can cause peripheral neuropathy. And that's what vincristine is. So we just call it Oncovin here so we can use the O because CHVP wouldn't be pronounceable, right? So this is vincristine. And then prednisone is added on. So RCHOP, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, hydroxydonumycin, vincristine or Oncovin, and prednisone. Tumor lysis syndrome is a relatively common side effect from rituximab, uh, although I guess you could probably get it anytime you're killing cancer cells in bulk. Uh, so uh, the side effects here really make sense if you consider what you're doing when you destroy cells. You destroy the cells and they spill out all their cytoplasm and within the cytoplasm is potassium and phosphates. Uh, so you can get hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, hyperuricemia, and hypocalcemia, low calcium. 
The treatment for this is allopurinol. Now, when you're giving rituximab, it's pretty common practice to give allopurinol, allopurinol prophylactically. However, I don't expect you to be asked this on the test uh, because this is typically up to the oncologist. Now, of course, we always try to avoid giving patients more drugs if we don't have to. And allopurinol itself carries with it some side effects. So with allopurinol, you can get renal failure. And coincidentally, you can get renal failure with tumor lysis syndrome as well. About 1 in 50 patients who are on allopurinol will get renal failure. And then allopurinol can also cause Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which can be deadly. Remember, that's where your skin starts peeling off, gets all red, starts peeling off. You can die from that. So we, uh, we try to avoid giving too many drugs, but because tumor lysis syndrome is so common, uh, we give allopurinol prophylactically most of the time. Remember what allopurinol, allopurinol is. It is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor, and xanthine oxidase produces uh, or catalyzes the production of uric acid. Um, so this helps to reduce the uric acid levels. So risk factors for NHL. There are a lot of them, and so this is something that sort of separates it from Hodgkin's disease. So a lot of the, uh, there are a lot of risk factors for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that we can kind of look at retrospectively. So certain genetic diseases, uh, particularly ones that involve uh, a trisomy, like Kleinfelter syndrome or Down syndrome, uh, and then a lot of the inherited immune deficiencies. So Chediak Higashi syndrome, severe combined immunodeficiency, uh, combined variable immunodeficiency, Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, among others. Uh, autoimmune diseases can be a risk factor for NHL, uh, and that's just primarily because you have an over active immune system. The immune system, the immune system itself, because it's it's lymphocytes that are involved in the immune system, if you have an overactive or underactive immune system, that puts you at risk for NHL, and that's a good way to remember it. So these genetic diseases uh, from Chediak Higashi syndrome to Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, these are uh, these are inherited immunodeficiencies, while well, these autoimmune diseases are overactive immune systems. So lupus, Sjogren's, and celiac disease, among others. Certain infectious agents can cause uh, uh, NHL, so EBV can cause Burkitt's lymphoma. Uh, H. pylori uh, can be a severe risk factor for malt lymphoma, and then HCV and HIV. And HIV also increases the risk factor for, uh, for, um, for uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Exposure to pesticides, herbicides, benzene, and hair dye, and then chemotherapy and radiation for another type of cancer. It increases your risk for lymphoma. Older age and male gender. So just comparing this to Hodgkin's lymphoma here, the symptoms are... Uh, Primarily the same, you get painless lymphadenopathy, night sweats, weight loss, and fever. Uh, then the incidence in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is more common overall, whereas Hodgkin's is a little less common. The age, however, most of your NHL patients are going to be older adults, so 50s, 60s, 70s. More commonly, However, uh, in Hodgkin's lymphoma, you're going to see patients who are in their 20s and 60s. There are non-Hodgkin's lymphomas that can present in young patients, and the first that comes to mind is Burkitt lymphoma. But, as a whole, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are more common in older patients, whereas Hodgkin's lymphoma, a lot of times you can see it in patients with, in their 20s. Where do you find the affected lymph nodes? In Hodgkin's, it tends to be in the cervical lymph nodes, but with any of these, you can find it anywhere. So you have to be doing a, you have to keep your eye out for any painless and large lymph nodes. The diagno diagnosis for both of these, the best initial test is excisional biopsy. You have to do that. It's the mainstay of diagnosis. You can't make a diagnosis without it. For Hodgkin's lymphoma, remember that stage 1 and 2 get radiation. Uh, if they have true stage 1 and stage or stage 2 lymphoma. So that means that they have it on one side of the diaphragm and they get uh, a bone marrow biopsy 
and they get a laparotomy, and none of the uh, biopsies show lymphoma. All the other patients uh, will be stage 3 and stage 4. They get chemo, and they get the ABVD chemo. In non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, they always get chemo, and the chemo that they get is the RCHOP, which we just talked about, and in patients who have a lumbar puncture that's positive for lymphoma, they're going to get methotrexate, and that methotrexate can be administered either intrathecally or intravenously. There's kind of a uh, more recent trend towards giving it intravenously but intrathecal or intravenous methotrexate for CNS disease. CNS involvement in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is much more common, and th so that's why we get the lumbar puncture in any patients uh, that have higher grade lymphoma or they've got CNS symptoms. And the survival overall for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is worse, but it really, really, really depends on what specific type of NHL they have. And that's it.